rejected and even met with some hostility when originally proposed to the U.S. military, soon after produced in the thousands and instrumental to Allied success in World War II. This is the story of the amphibious DUKW. It was early 1942, and Allied fleets sat anchored off the coasts of Europe and North Africa, waiting to offload, for weeks, sometimes even months. From the U.S. Army Transport Museum, ships waited for barges, barges waited for trucks, and trucks waited for trains. Of course, these weren't civilian cargo ships with retail goods that could wait indefinitely. It was nearing the height of World War II, and the consequence of Allies gaining ground in these theaters often meant devastated ports and unapproachable shorelines, preventing typical docking operations. These ships were all on a mission to get troops ashore, weapons ashore, ammo, crucial supplies like water, food, and more, so that war efforts could continue. Tasked with solving problems like these in World War II was the NDRC, or the National Defense Research Committee, created by order of President Roosevelt in June 1940. From the text, Organizing Scientific Research for War, one of the most significant facts about this group was the sense of urgency with which it was imbued. The fact that the civilian members were well known to each other, both personally and professionally, made it easy for them to work together effectively with a minimum loss of time. The committee was directed to correlate and support scientific research on the mechanisms and devices of warfare. With the exception of flight-based problems, which was reserved for the National Advisory Committee for Aeronautics, or NACA, NASA's predecessor. In 1941, the National Defense Research Committee, though, would be restructured into the Office of Scientific Research and Development. This transition did mark several changes for military research, but I'll just ramble on here if I let myself, so we'll keep the duck video moving forward. The OSRD would take on the NDRC's functions and be in place for the remainder of World War II until 1947. Composed of engineers, designers, technicians, and entrepreneurs, one such task was solving the issue of getting troops and supplies not only to the beach like a landing craft, but further inland, a more direct delivery to those fighting further ashore. Nicknamed the SEEP, or the Sea Jeep, this initial attempt would be the quarter-ton Ford GPA, based on the original Ford GPW, or, as it's more commonly known, the venerable Willie's Jeep. The SEEP would be its amphibian counterpart. A fascinating vehicle itself, the SEEP, though, you might think, was obviously too small for this task of ferrying dozens of troops, thousands of pounds of supplies, up and down beaches, to and from ships. They tried it though, and what looked like essentially a two-seater jeep with a boat around it was not up to the task of carrying more than a handful of soldiers and their gear. There was even a little floating trailer built to match, which was comically tiny. The seep was small, difficult to maneuver, and in anything but the calmest waters, at risk of capsizing quickly or outright sinking. Shallow waters, easy river crossings, narrow roads, ferrying two or three VIPs. Sure, the seep could handle it, but it wasn't up to the task of ship-to-shore cargo runs. The OSRD had gone back to the drawing board with, of course, time being of the essence. These weren't situations where designers and engineers were given years to perfect their creations. Every moment lost meant another moment boots on the ground went without crucial supplies. This need to move men, cargo, and equipment from ship to shore and then beyond with minimal transfer prompted Major General Jacob Devers to write the OSRD informing them of this. Devers, chief of the U.S. Army's armored force, an officer who would eventually be referred to as the man who may win or lose the war, was able to see future strategic needs where many otherwise couldn't. In March of 1942, the OSRD received this request. The head of the department, Vannevar Bush, assigning the project to his colleague and fellow MIT graduate, Palmer C. Putnam. This was an idea, though, the OSRD had been quietly drawing up already for months. And Devers' request was the sign-off they needed to see it through, or so they thought. Bush gave the job to Putnam knowing he was a man that could get difficult things done, and Putnam turned to General Motors. GM put together a team that, reportedly, in one long weekend, produced a mock-up of sheet metal, wood, and cardboard based on Putnam's ideas and drawings. They also put together the following coded project name, D for model year 1942, U for utility truck, 
K for all-wheel drive, W for dual rear driving axles. Putnam would also look to Sparkman and Stevens for their prowess in yachting and naval architecture to design a welded hull that would fit under and around the chassis of an army truck. The Newport, Rhode Island firm of brothers Drake and James Sparkman, James Murray, and brothers Olin and Roderick Stevens. Both Stevens brothers involved heavily in yachting and America's Cup victories, well known especially in New England. Putnam and GM would agree the GMC 508 series was the ideal fit for this project. This 2.5 ton 6x6 was of GMC's CCKW platform, and more specifically the long wheelbase CCKW 353. C for model year 1941, C for conventional cab, K for all wheel drive, though some records say this indicated front wheel drive. However, when the design is used for other GM models in the same time period and after, it's tended to indicate all wheel drive or four wheel drive were applicable and again, W for dual driving rear axles. Already fully in production and capable of handling the weights and bulk of the modifications, the original Deuce and a Half by GMC provided both a quicker design process and a tried and tested manufacturing process, at least for the truck portion, should the project move forward into mass production. The Dux design would retain the CCKW's gasoline engine, revise the transmission to allow for easy transition from power to the wheels, through propeller power and back, integrate the stern rudder into the steering system such that the front wheels continue to steer normally while the rudder steered in the opposite direction. The front wheels actually aided in waterborne steering and maneuverability in the water was better than expected. The standard issue Army Duck would be 31 feet in length, 8 feet wide, powered by that carryover engine, a 91 horsepower, gasoline-fueled 270 cubic inch GMC six-cylinder, placed in the bow in a near cab-over configuration. The engine compartment below and slightly forward of the driver's seat underneath the hood, or in this instance, a watertight hatch. Just forward of that, another smaller hatch leading into the bow compartment. A significantly more complex cockpit than that of the Deuce and a Half truck. Top speeds are roughly 50 miles per hour on land, five to seven miles per hour in the water, depending on conditions. A 40 gallon fuel tank with a range of 240 miles on land, 50 miles in the water, an empty weight of 14,880 pounds, which varied depending on the duck variant, which we'll touch on later, and capable of carrying 5,000 pounds in cargo, or roughly 28 people total, equipped with a powered winch, an M36 standard truck turret mount for use when needed, at a cost of roughly $6,000 per unit, approximately $109,000 in 2022. The whole would be designed with ease of production and initial buoyancy in mind. It was truly a straightforward, no-nonsense design. There were no cutouts for steps or really any methods to climb aboard. No tailgate, no ladders in the standard design. No integration of any method to load or offload once on land. The Army would later improvise methods to make offloading a bit more workable, but otherwise the intention during military operations was to load from above, both at sea and inside their mothership, with troops, cargo, supplies being dropped in via cranes, ropes, or ladders. Rapid deployment, maximizing payload, and incredibly rapid mass production was the intended purpose. The interior and hull, being so spartan, were perfect for this, keeping empty weights as low as possible and leaving the interior as wide open as possible to accommodate various cargoes. Their freeboard, though, was minimal when loaded, and the hull was not created with any reserve buoyancy to speak of. Bilge pumps were the only defense in the event of flooding so this would leave them quite vulnerable to sinking if damaged, overloaded, or handled improperly. And I cover the effect and meaning of a vessel's reserve buoyancy, or lack thereof, and how these vessels entered civilian service in great detail on my main channel, Brick and Mortar. Link to the Stretch Duck 7 video in description. This was of course a military vessel, so the Army's designs were never intended to meet civilian safety and accessibility standards anyway. By June 2nd, 1942, just over two months after Major General Devers penned his letter to the OSRD, the first prototype was already being tested. Road testing and water testing took place at Fort Belvoir, Virginia. In July, a successful demonstration at Army Base Fort Story, Virginia, meant a first step in acceptance as an initial relatively small order for 2,000 units was placed. The DUKW entered Army standardization by October of that same year, and production began straight away at GM's Yellow Coach facility in Pontiac, Michigan.
However, this parade of success after success for the duck program would soon come to a screeching halt. The Army's amphibious needs throughout World War II were complex. It was a quickly evolving field, and there were many schools of thought in the U.S. military, some adhered to vehemently. Not everyone in the Army shared Devers' vision of just how this would be carried out, and there was actually some hostility toward the duck program. The duck's reception had been lukewarm at best. An order of 2,000 units for trucks in a crucial support role like this wasn't all that much. Putnam, Sparkman, Stevens, and the GM team had their hopes and expectations much higher, based on their foresight of needs soon to come in both theaters of war. Eisenhower at the time, Major General, and playing a crucial role in overall war strategy for the defeat of Japan and Germany, penned an April 1942 memorandum to the newly appointed Commander-in-Chief of the Atlantic Fleet, Admiral Ernest King, stating, In the Atlantic we may become involved in a cross-channel effort with the consequent need for landing equipment designed especially for that purpose. Moreover, any amphibious operations will probably be merely the spearhead of a prolonged heavy land operation. This is the type of task for which Army divisional and higher organization is definitely pointed. And this would be precursors to the planned Operations Roundup and Sledgehammer. His memorandum went on to say, In the Pacific, offensive operations for the next year or more promised to comprise a series of landing operations from shipboard to small islands with relatively minor forces. This is the type of amphibious warfare for which the Marines have been specially organized. Operations Roundup and Sledgehammer, two potential real-world scenarios where Allies cross the English Channel in an all-out amphibious assault on the beaches of France, but not using the Navy's landing ships to deploy the amphibious craft. The craft, filled with troops and weapons, were to be the entire shore-to-shore -shore operation. We can always look back at World War II and oversimplify much of the events that did transpire, as with anything in history, but it simply cannot be overstated just how fast all this was moving since the bombing of Pearl Harbor just a few months prior, in December of 1941. And these fast-moving initiatives meant crews, officers, and entire military branches had to adapt, evolve, and cooperate in ways that were altogether new not to mention the cooperation and coordination between allies. It was a dynamic, complex learning process with some of the highest stakes in modern history. For example, in March of 1942, the U.S. Navy agreed to the Army taking lead on the amphibious contingent, since initial plans meant for direct shore-to-shore -shore operations, not the usual ship-to-shore operations joint forces were familiar with. Army ground forces would be tasked with developing doctrine, training tactical units, and handling, quote, all phases of the operation of Army units involved in embarking troops and equipment in small boats on land, the approach to and landing on a hostile beach, the establishment of beachheads, and the preparation and initiation of an attack inland. In June of 1942, Engineer Amphibian Command, or EAC, was established at Camp Edwards in Massachusetts, along with the Army's new Amphibious Training Command, ATC. This Cape Cod location was intended to train upcoming boat operating regiments, boat maintenance battalions, and all supporting units. With so much training needed and not enough equipment to go around, many maintenance courses were led by local civilian boat and yacht companies. But at the time, this was limited to the 36-foot landing craft vehicle, or LCV, and 50-foot landing craft mechanized, or LCM. This was of course very beach assault oriented, hence the landing craft. While still considered amphibious operations, it wasn't addressing the specific needs that the duck program sought to fulfill. This portion of the logistics is still not perceived as an issue by many in Army brass. Those landing craft being prepped weren't technically amphibious. The landing craft brought the units to the beach, the units would bring themselves supplies or cargo further up the beach, and so on. Those who saw the duck's potential saw this middleman system being completely eliminated when it came to resupply further inland, and in the process, offered much quicker, more efficient, and quickly repeatable turnaround, a process that would also potentially free up those landing craft for their intended assault roles anyway. The planned shore-to-shore -shore channel crossings were losing steam altogether by July though, and the sooner upcoming North Africa-based Operation Torch, which ruled out shore-to-shore -shore landing craft assaults altogether, cast even more doubt overall on the Army-led amphibious programs. The solution would be that which, eventually, featured so heavily throughout World War II, ship-to-shore joint landing and amphibious assault parties. But this was the Navy's world, 
and meant the command structure would have to be revised once again, since landing ships would be deploying landing craft. And so the tug of war went between the Army and Navy throughout 1942. In my assessment, it kind of seemed as though the grand strategic plans, shifting so frequently, meant supply and support logistics, the minute level details for those large-scale operations, were taking a back seat until larger strategic decisions could get sorted. It was said, Putnam was one of the Duck Program's staunchest believers. With the paltry 2,000 units ordered and interest declining, he feared even the currently ordered Ducks might sit out the war in some Detroit warehouse. Putnam would cheerleader quite effectively behind the scenes, reported to have considerable pull in the U.S. military bureaucracy. He'd somehow arranged a demonstration for a reported 90 officers to take place at the coast near Provincetown and Cape Cod, scheduled for December of 1942 one final chance to prove the duck's worth. The demonstration would consist of several ducks unloading a ship's cargo and carrying it inland. On December 1st, though, a few days before this would even get started, a storm with near-hurricane-force winds struck the area. A small Coast Guard patrol craft, the Rose, on U-boat watch duty, ran aground on a sandbar. It wasn't safely ashore either, and the seven crew aboard were at risk as the boat began breaking up. It was being so heavily battered by 60 mile per hour winds and high seas. A Coast Guard officer, aware of the duck trials at Provincetown and running out of options, called Roderick Stevens of Sparkman and Stevens. He was already well known in the area, but the Coast Guard was also aware he may be able to launch one of those already prepped ducks and rescue the seven crew. Stevens gathered a small team, a marine photographer, and they blasted out into the surf, heading to rescue the Rose crew. They safely rescued all seven and brought them ashore. The marine photographer on board, Stanley Rosenfeld, reportedly went straight to his New York studio, printed the photos, and headed straight to Washington, D.C., handing them directly to an Army official. Keep in mind, the Coast Guard was a branch of the Navy at this time. Rosenfeld stating, I suggested he might enjoy showing them to the Secretary of the Navy. He was most delighted to demonstrate an Army rescue of the Navy and was sure that President Roosevelt would also enjoy the event. Four days later, they also carried out their unloading demonstration and reportedly made short work of 10-foot waves, rough seas on the day of the trials. The feat had never been performed so quickly and seamlessly. Many Army observers were loving it. Some of the top brass, though, still just breathed a collective, meh. She's better in water than any truck, and she'll beat any boat on a highway, Roderick Stevens was quoted saying. The duck would also be iterated upon throughout its years of manufacture. It was, after all, unique and never attempted before, so learning its quirks had to be done on the fly, as did implementing them into upcoming variants. From what I can find, though, they didn't seem to have any sort of names or designations for each version, just those familiar, recognizing versions by various particulars. For example, one of the easiest identifiers of the later versions is the sloping windshield. Crucially and revolutionary at the time, the Duck was the first vehicle ever to fully integrate a central tire pressure control system, available via controls at the driver's position. The Ducks could deflate and reinflate their tires on the fly. This was realized as time went on and installed on later versions. It was the first known vehicle to implement such a system. Designers steadily learned the challenges they were up against, from exiting and entering water via varying surfaces, off-roading over just about anything, from rocks and boulders to rubble. But more importantly, any vessel that approaches shores less than ideal must be prepared to overcome jagged reefs, sharp coral, and rocks that hide just below the waterline. The ducks weren't like the normal landing craft hulls either. Their tires were deeper in the water than the vessel's bottom. The field manual has some interesting instructions for ideal tire pressures too. I thought this picture was pretty cool. The hopes of those many Engineer Amphibian Command, or EAC units, along with the Army's Amphibious Training Command, being prepped for joint operations to conduct landing assaults were dashed by late summer 1942. In September, the originally planned 18 engineer regiments was reduced to only eight amphibious brigades, then down to five, with only three of those being operational, the other two put into reserve. Many remaining units were set to Northern Africa in support roles for General Patton's upcoming Operation Torch landings. It's thought at this point some 55 of those original ducks ordered by the Army feared mothballed by the duck team, made their way into Patton's command, and then were put to use in Algeria. 
Soon after, Colonel Arthur Trudeau, the EAC's chief of staff, saw a need for amphibian brigades in General Douglas MacArthur's Southwest Pacific Theater. Seeing MacArthur's need to move men, equipment, and supplies through shallow coastal and inland dotted waters, the Army and Joint Chiefs agreed to deploy the nearly defunct 2nd, 3rd, and 4th Engineer Amphibian Battalions. This decision was made in November 1942, the 1st Brigade arriving in Australia early in 43, where it's possible even more of those originally ordered ducks were sent as well. It's reported that General MacArthur was ecstatic upon receiving the Amphibious Brigade's assistance. It's said those 55 cents of General Patton in Algeria made such an impression on him he personally insisted they receive as many as possible for the upcoming Allied invasion of Sicily, Operation Husky, which ended up taking place July through August of 1943. A reported 1,000 ducks participating in the joint UK-US operation, there were plans for Allied forces originally to land near Palermo, in the north of Sicily, but this risked the security of the operation with heavily defended Axis positions right near the coast. The alternative proposed by General Sir Bernard Montgomery to land all forces along the southeast meant less risk in combat but substantial risk in logistics owing to the large swaths of beaches and crossing them to support troops further inland once engaged allied forces would go with montgomery's proposed course in sicily and much to their surprise the beach logistics proved far more doable than expected while rough seas hindered navy landing craft army ducks made quick work of the conditions crashing into and out of the surf bringing supplies sometimes so far inland that they delivered the precious cargo right onto narrow Sicilian streets. General Sir Harold Alexander stating, It is not too much to say that the Ducks revolutionized the problem of beach maintenance. In most articles and sources, this event is reported as the Duck Program's big break. Regardless, it happened during such a crucial operation that it could no longer be ignored. Allied forces needed the GMC DUKW. From then on, orders would be placed in the thousands. The Yellow Coach facility in Pontiac was quickly overwhelmed, a Chevrolet plant in St. Louis picking up the slack. From the Center of Military History's Transportation Corps, Operations Overseas, an Army report on the Sicilian campaign stated, The newly devised 2.5-ton DUKW was amazingly successful in landing maintenance supplies. It could deliver directly from ship to dump, thereby eliminating double handling of cargo at the beaches. Because the 7th Army did not have enough trucks, the DUKW frequently was diverted from its proper ship-to-shore orbit and driven further inland, thus restricting its availability for cargo discharge. In several instances, ducks capsized and sank because of overloading. Despite limited carrying capacity and the constant problem of maintenance, the advantages of the duck far outweighed its shortcomings. Even Eisenhower reported the duck to be invaluable. 1942 saw the production of roughly 2,000 units, but from the Center of Military History's publication on Army Ordnance, Procurement, and Supply, 1943 saw 4,508 units produced, 1944, 11,316, leaving 3,323 in 1945 for a total of 21,147 ducks produced. The training program, as with so many others in World War II, was also constantly evolving. In addition to Camp Edward, the Army's facility at the San Francisco Port of Embarkation would take on part of the responsibility, with ducks training jointly alongside Navy ships. The General Motors War Products School would also train amphibious instructors and maintenance officers. The training classes were also extended from three weeks to two months or more. The vehicle was much more complex than the average truck and prone to issues, playing pivotal roles in operations like D-Day, the crossing of the Rhine, and assault roles in the Pacific Theater. Other Allied forces made extensive use of them as well. Under the Lend-Lease program, an approximate 2,000 units were used by the UK, 800 by Canadian forces, 586 by the Soviets, 535 by the Australians, with other military operators including Brazil, Iraq, France, the Philippines, and Dominican Republic. The Pacific Theater saw them in more direct assault-oriented roles. Used by the Marine Corps, they were met initially with much doubt, soldiers quacking as they lumbered by. And then they were spotted performing yet another one of the duties they became famous for, carrying the wounded out to sea to the safety of hospital ships. The Marine Amphibian Truck Companies would come to be known as the Quack Corps. 
The DUKW was one of those engineering feats that couldn't have been a better fit during a short window of what was near perfect timing. The Soviets were so satisfied with the 500 plus units they'd received via the Lend-Lease program, they created their own domestic version based heavily on the original Ducks. The BAV-485, nearly identical, but with a few upgrades like an opening tailgate for easier load and unload. That window of dire duck need in World War II, though, was all but non-existent for the U.S. military once the war came to a close. In what was known as the Great Sell-Off, ducks went up for sale to the public by the thousands. And the U.S. wasn't alone. Civilians and other allied countries ended up with ducks in their possession. The tragic story of passenger duck tours using modified versions of the original ducks I tell in great detail on my main channel. Again, link in description. Those still in U.S. military inventories did see action in the Korean War, and at the same time, the Navy was growing concerned about the slow speed of amphibious craft when in the water between ship and shore, potentially leaving them vulnerable in future conflicts. During the mid-1950s, Miami Shipbuilding would work on hydrofoil testing with the Office of Naval Research. Achieving some success, this got the attention of the Army, who provided a duck for experimentation. With a foil system designed and installed, along with the assistance of a Lycoming T-53 gas turbine engine, real-world testing was carried out successfully, and the flying duck was born. The ungainly, makeshift craft getting up on plane and reaching speeds of around 30 miles per hour, compared to its paltry 7 miles per hour top speed in the water normally. Adding in the turbine engine, though, looks to have removed their practicality for the most part. I've been digging and digging and can't find out what came of this particular project. The fate of Miami shipbuilding is readily available, an interesting story itself, but what came of this flying duck, I have no idea. Might be interesting to investigate further. Also in the mid-1950s, two Australian Defense Force ducks were sent to aid in the Australian National Antarctic Research Expedition. They actually played a crucial role in these expeditions all the way up until 1970 when they were replaced by the more modern LARC-V. The Australian Department of Defense stating, the vehicles, although never designed to operate in such harsh conditions, performed well, making the transport of cargo from ship to shore that much safer and more efficient. Many civilian uses included emergency services, and many have been right at home rescuing survivors, from the 1952 floods in Devon, England, to the 2000 floods in New Orleans, Louisiana, resulting from Hurricane Katrina. The duck would be superseded by many larger, more versatile variants, but none would ever come close to matching the pivotal role they played in so many of World War II's decisive turning points. <laughs>